Several months ago, I interviewed Nagpur Chogyam, an English blues-playing Nagpur and teacher of Tibetan Buddhism. Nagpur Chogyam was one of the most popular and discussed guests that I've had on my series, and the interview is a personal favorite of mine. Since that time, we kept in touch, and in December 2018, I went down to the deepest Wales to visit Nagpur Chogyam and his wife and teaching partner, Kandra Dechen, at their home. A big part of the way that Nagpur Chogyam and Kandra Dechen teach is through the way that they live their lives. And as such, in this video, we go on a tour of their house, their shrine room, their music and writing spaces. We find out how appreciation for the shape of a Fender Telecaster is actually an entryway to compassion. Nagpur Chogyam takes us on a tour of his personal wardrobe and explains how he takes, as he puts it, sartorialism as an art form. We talk about crazy wisdom and why that's different from the sort of guru abuse that we hear so commonly about today. They also talk candidly about the controversy around their being reincarnated lamas and Nagpur Chogyam being a treasure revealer. We even have a blues jam. <laughs> That's just some of what we talk about. I think you're going to find it very, very interesting. So without further ado, let's get to it. So this through here is the scullery, which used to be a walkway through for the horses that came stable. Here's a bathroom. Here the frogs are a theme. You, you get frog presents all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we do. This is the shrine room, as you can see. Padmasambhava, Yishitsogyal, this one's Arulingma. This is one you won't recognize. Uh, Arulingma is the origin of the Tama. Uh, this is Aruyeshe, this is the son of Arulingma. And his two consorts, who were sisters. This is Ashikandro, and this is Ayekandro. Ayekandro is the previous incarnation of Khandra Dechen. In this cow here, this is uh, Jomu Sampel. She's the Sanyum of our teacher, Kunzan Dojo Rinpoche. This you don't see very often. This is Mengtze. In the largest Nyingma Gompas, there'll always be a statue of Mengtze there because he represents the lineage of 80 Chan masters in the Nyingma tradition. And my father brought this one back from China in... Um, Ooh, 1937, and it was always in our home, and I inherited it, and um, my father always called him Confucius, although he's not. He's, uh, I don't know the Chinese name from the Tibetans call him Mengzi, which means the long life man. Why is that particular purba wrapped at the back there? Uh, that's wrapped because it's the one that is in use, and so the top of it is hidden unless it's being used. There are many different kinds of symbolic practice around Purba. Mm -hmm. um, fundamentally, stabbing, attraction, aversion, and indifference. So if one has them, one stabs them. <laughs> in there also, there's a hammer. We had it made in, in, in Finland because Dujan Rinpoche said that Scandinavia was a hidden land. And um, there's a connection between the, the old Norse um, deities and, and the protectors. So Thor is very much like Doji Legpa. So this is made of oak, this is Finnish oak. We've got a Vajra terminal here. But we were looking for something that looked like Thor's hammer. Of course, if you Google Thor's hammer, you get Marvel magazines. <laughs> And that's all you find. Uh, we then found some kind of Victorian picture of Thor that had a different kind of hammer, but it was quite ornate and obviously not a, a working hammer. And then one of our students found these uh, in the Helsinki Museum. And this is a, a Neolithic hammer head. Well, this isn't, but um, it, it's, it's an exact copy of it. And there were about 20 or 30 of them. They all had exactly this shape. As soon as I saw it, I thought, this is the one we'll use, uh, because it's such a strange thing. You wonder why somebody ever made it with this undercut here. 
which should surely weaken it if it was made of stone. What, what the purpose could have been, I have no idea. But uh, Anyway, so that's the one we chose for the hammer of uh, Doge Legpa. Doge Legpa is one of the three major Nima protectors. You know, the, the Maza Dosum, uh, Mamu Ekejati. They're just down there. In the yeah, there we are. Mamu Ekejati, Zara Hula, and this one is Doge Legpa. Those are heads from a very large statue, a uh, Rossville statue, a garland of 52 severed heads which represent the 52 neurotic concepts. Although this room <laughs> represents ritual to a large degree, our major practice is silent sitting, but all this is Maha Yoga, and there's a certain extent of our practice that is Maha Yoga, because I've also practiced... Um, Dujram Tear, because um, the previous uh, Dujram Rinpoche was, was my first major teacher. Mm. And so I, I have um, uh, Dujram Tear practices that I keep up. Is this where you practice? Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 And if we, um, we sometimes give empowerments here, if we have um, students who come wishing a certain kind of empowerment, then this is the place we give it. And we have these chairs because we're alta carcass, as, as it were, <laughs> aged and infirm, and um, uh, they're slightly more comfortable than um, yeah. sitting on a throne. Mm. Thrones are very un un mm. un uncomfortable. In our tradition, it's not particularly important where you sit, or what, you don't have to sit on the floor. Right. You just sit where you're comfortable so that you're not distracted. By discomfort. Do you, in your uh, tradition, teach yogas of the channels and this yes, sort of thing? Yes, certainly. Salon, yes. Salon, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that require certain postures? Yes. Mm -hmm. For sitting and so on? Lotus and all that sort of thing? Uh, yes, um, some of them do. Um, Tumo does. Um, uh, I'm afraid I was a Tumo reject. Uh, <laughs> How does one become a Tumo reject? Uh, uh, well, uh, by having legs like mine, I, I, one really has to start to mode about the age of between 8 to 12, uh, unless you're extremely fit. And just getting into Lotus was hard enough for me, and I could never really manage it well. But as to leaping from Lotus into the air, well, I couldn't do that anyway. I couldn't get onto my feet. But the um, breathing exercises were extremely good and valuable, and I've kept them up ever since. Who was your teacher for that? It was um, Kukunzang Dojo Rinpoche. He was uh, one of the uh, major Tsalung masters of the 20th century, really. Extraordinary. And what is Tsalung? Tsalung is the uh, manipulation of the subtle winds in the channels and uh, coordinated with breath, uh, there are various exercises, I suppose. Tumo is probably the most well-known, the you know, development of heat. Um, the route I took after I, f after I failed with Tumo was a poa, you know, the um, projection of consciousness. That's where you end up with this stalk of kusha grass in the top of your head. And they push it through the skull. If you can do that and you... Um, pronounce the syllables and it quivers then then you're all set can you do that i did that um, one of our students has just done that in um in boda mm -hmm. she's just um completed a retreat with the arote purva uh, so the arote poa um so that was quite exciting for us mm. to have you know, someone do that it means that at the time of their death they will be able to die consciously and they will be able to actually choose the point at which they die. They'll also be able to help other people with the death process, which is extremely important um, to be able to do that. Um, so it has to do with uh, using the energy of the Tsalung system. Um, oh, people are more familiar probably with um, uh, Nadi, Prana and Bindu. Those are the Sanskrit words, but... Um, Tsalung and Tigli are the Tibetan terms. And so it's getting in contact with that particular energy 
and being able to control that so that uh, one can experience it in a spatial cons- um, a spatial condition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what uh, does that practice uh, involve for your student? Um, well, first of all, a great deal of recitation of Lishit Sogyal Mantra and the visualization of Lishit Sogyal. And then basically the visualization of, of a tigli that rises to various different points and then is ejected with the use of certain syllables. And when that's been practiced enough, you eventually get a, a soft spot on, on the top of the head that actually you know, pusses up and cracks open and, and the suture opens a little bit and the, this stalk of kusha grass can be inserted at that point by the teacher. Fortunately, she's got Jomo uh, Sampal Dechen Rupeshe, the um, Sangyum of our teacher out there who's, mm. who's gone through that with her. And, she, and with the delights of WhatsApp, we now have a photograph of her with the kusha grass in her head. How cool is that? That's extraordinary. I think one of the important things... Um, about the Gurkha Changlo Day is that um, practice is integrated with everyday life and work and so uh, um, one can be in retreat or, or a semi-open style of retreat. Actually, retreat is a, is a deeply stupid word. <laughs> uh, the Tibetan word is tsam, which means uh, confines or, or parameters. So you can set the parameters up in in any way you like, but you have to remain within the parameters that you set. Mm. So, for example, um, our student is a physical therapist, and so during her retreat she had clients at certain times, but the rest of the time was retreat. And it's this um, way of working with everyday life that's really important for people, that you don't actually have to carve out a huge piece mm. of time mm. because that makes it impossible for mm. a lot of people. Yeah, so that's not compatible with working in family life, which mm. is where most of us are. Mm. We don't have independent wealth that we can just take a year off or three years right. off. And this occurred in Tibet as well. It yeah. was quite common in the Nyingma tradition. The um, three-year retreat is, uh, is really only a couple of hundred years old as a formulation, and, but... You know, people now feel that it has to happen, or long retreat has to happen. Mm-hmm. The word for you know, marmot is uh, tsitsigomchen, which means the great meditating rat, i.e., you know, it hibernates. But when it comes out of its period of hibernation, it's still a marmot. <laughs> <laughs> so, hence, uh, you can go into retreat, but it depends what you do in there. The retreat's mm-hmm. not going to. People also go, you know, go to prison for three years and they don't come out realised. Um, so it's um, we tend to lay an emphasis on on uh, short periods of mm. retreat. But the retreats are quite intensive. Yeah. So that will be rising early and going to bed quite late, and every half hour or hour will be accounted for in activity of practice, apart from the breakfast, lunch, and mm. dinner break, which would be an hour each, um, all the rest of the time, will be fairly quickly changing practice, because um, if you're to spend hours in silent sitting, you can very quickly um, get sleepy. So we will intersperse physical practice with silent sitting, yogic song with silent sitting, So it's quite quickly changing, so it's fresh all the time, because it's quality that's important. So, dressing room. Uh, I've always taken um, um, sartorialism to be an art form. What have we got in here? This, one of my favourite things, this is uh, Mr Darcy's dressing gown. Not the actual dressing gown in Pride and Prejudice, but uh, exactly the same model, which was made by the same company that made his. I happen to know a lady who worked there, and she got it made up for me. So, I mean, this is something that anyone can do in particular. 
This is a Georgian coat made in um, Donegal tweed. I love Donegal tweed. It's the hippies tweed. Here it's got these sparkles of, of colour in it. It's amazing stuff. It's actually, you know, it's interesting how clothing is more something for other people than it is for yourself because when you're wearing it, you can't see it. It's other people who are seeing it. And I've always found it makes a nice um, connection with other human beings. People are always saying hello to me. It, it creates a lot of friendliness in life that, mm. that I enjoy. You get lots of nice comments from ladies about your hats as yes. well, don't you? Yeah. Of course, there's a, a, we have our Tibetan robes that we have a variety of different things, but, um, but I generally enjoy wearing you know, traditional clothing, but from all varieties of cultures. Um, I, I've got some various items of Hasidic clothing, a nice Hasidic silk jacket that I bought in one of the shops in Borough Park in New York. That, um, I remember when I was first in New York, I went, um, one of my first students there, I asked him, I said, who are these guys at the airport that dress really sharp, you know? And he said, well, describe him. I said, well, they're all in black. And they have a black hat, white shirt. And I said, they've got these little bits of hair here. And he looked at me and he said, sharp? <laughs> he said, you must be joking. I said, no, I think they're really sharp. Uh, he's Jewish also, but he, he had no way of understanding these people as being sharp. And I said, yeah, I love the way they dress. You know, it's really, they've got real style, those people. And, that came as a shock to him that anyone would find the Hasidim sharp. But... This here is um, a pair of lederhosen, but they're um, carpenter's lederhosen, so they're long. They don't make them anymore. I had a pair when I was young that belonged to my uncle. I got them made up again by a gentleman in Austria who fortunately knew what I was talking about and was able to remake them. And then on top I've got a thing that's entirely untraditional, which is a, the six-pocket waistcoat, which is my particular creation, because I like having a, a walking filing cabinet. You mentioned the impact on others is... Is primary, but does it give you a certain feeling to dress that way? Yeah, it gives me a sense that I'm relieving people of what would other be the horrid experience of seeing me. <laughs> <laughs> they get something slightly more pleasant to look at. But there is an aspect of practice in all this, that um, if you wear certain clothes, it makes you behave. Or you take on a different demeanour. Not that you behave differently, exactly, but you have a different... You walk differently. I think for you to walk in your shamtab, it makes you walk differently, doesn't it, because you were wearing a skirt. Mm -hmm. And um, it's connected with the practice of um, what we would call wearing the body of visions, which is actually wearing the appearance of the yidam. Um, because one's whole world is connected with practice. Um, if you're engaged in visualisation practice of a yidam in, down in the shrine room and you finish your practice and you get up and walk away, you don't leave that behind. You take it out into the world with you as much as possible. So I think the, the connection with clothing is, is connected with moving into that practice. It's also about appreciation and it goes into cooking, it goes into every aspect of life that... Um, I think one of the things that is not really understood concerning compassion is that compassion is not simply wanting the whole world to have a cookie. Uh, it is appreciative. One of the things that's important in, um, in terms of compassion can be seen really in the advice they give you uh, as a counsellor. But if you ever get a client you don't like, you have to refer that client because you can't help a person you don't like. So it's important that you appreciate 
your client, otherwise you can't help. Um, so there's this communicative aspect that, that, that goes through all the arts, which is why clothing is an art, uh, especially in terms of Vajrayana. I think in the West there used to be this, I, I think there still is a, a divide between art and craft, that art is something high and craft is looked down upon. Um, that wouldn't be the case with Vajrayana. That everything that is created, whether it's perfume, whether it's food, whatever it is, poetry, painting, dance, uh, they're all arts and they're all equal. There's no hierarchy of the senses. Uh, there's no hierarchy also for concept consciousness in terms of what is written as poetry or what is created in that way. So um, one of the things that both Konzan Dojo Rinpoche and Dojo Rinpoche emphasized was that uh, you know, to be a Vajrayana practitioner is to be an artist. And so it's, it's important to explore the arts. Not everyone is going to be that wonderful at every art, but um, what everybody has is a place that they live and clothes that they put on. So this is a basic thing in which anyone can invest if they want to. And it doesn't have to be expensive either. You know, I, I, I wouldn't like anyone to get the idea that um, it costs a lot to do this. You simply have to iron your trousers um, Having had a German mother, I starch everything. Uh, you know, I like to get the shirts like cardboard. You know, <laughs> can you can you say a bit more about um, uh, the connection between wearing the wearing the appearance of the yidam and clothing, or maybe just how one does carry that um, body of the yidam off of the cushion that you were describing there. Well, I think that uh, the main point is that uh, care and attention are taken and that you explore your appreciative faculties uh, to the best of your ability. This naturally leads on to um, becoming an individual. The older I get, the more, I, well, both of us realise that most of the world is driven by fashion. Uh, fashions in everything, fashions in politics, fashions in religion. You can see it at the moment. You can almost tell who's going to be the anti-Brexit person because you, all you have to know is their background and you're going to know what they vote. And, you, uh, and it makes us wonder how much have you thought about this in either direction, either for or against. So there's a fashion for, a fashion against... There seems to be a fashion for everything. And it's breaking out of those fashions uh, by learning how to appreciate, how to become an individual by actually allowing the sense fields to function. You know, looking at things and wondering what your relationship with them is, not in an intellectual way, but simply color, form, whatever it is. And once you start to appreciate, then you can become an individual. Having become an individual, then that becomes apparent to other people. And the compassion of the whole situation is what sparks people off into things. Um, we have a student um, in California who, for most of his life, has desired a Jimi Hendrix jacket. You know, the green one with the frogging that actually belongs to a veterinary corps. Um, and so one day I said to him, you know, why not just buy it? You know? And he thought this was a sort of a rather outrageous idea because it was fairly expensive. I said, well, you're going to wear it for the rest of your life, aren't you? Uh, you're probably going to wear it out, so is it expensive? And so he finally went for it. And um, he's had a fascinating time with it on aircraft, everywhere. People speak to him wherever he goes. Uh, and so a whole wealth of human communication has opened up there. And uh, the interesting thing is it's not a thing I'd wear. Well, it's not that I'd reject wearing it. If you gave it to me, I'd wear it. But I mean, but I love seeing him in it. So it's not that 
it it has to be something you'd want to wear, but you see somebody else wearing something that expresses what they are, and that's communicative. And that is all part of bodhicitta, because bodhicitta is vast. It's not just contained in uh, moral, ethical, altruistic principles. It's pervasive. Uh, It's a natural phenomenon. You know, it's not... It doesn't only exist as this codified thing of wanting all beings to achieve realization. That is a really narrow view of it. Of course it's that, but it's far more than that in that it permeates everything. And the more in tune with it you become, the more powerful it it gets. And this is what I meant about leaving the cushion behind. Because in your life, the more reminders you have about practice the better so the idea of um, walking away from the shrine room as Pamas and Bhavri or Yeshit Sogyal that then alters the way that you behave in life Um, and it's the circumstances of your life that are the reminders to practice so you might be less likely to um, suddenly be taken aback, at, angry at your child for doing something unpredictable for a moment. You, it might give you that just space of the moment so that you don't launch forth. You just have more of a sense of spaciousness. These are 1850s. This one actually arrived uh, in a parcel from the States anonymously uh, saying, happy birthday, have fun. And so I, I, I unwrapped it and I thought, blimey, what's this? And uh, I never had any great interest in guns. And um, so one of my students said, oh, you can put firing caps on this and make it go bang. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And so, so I thought, I'll learn how to... So I wasn't better. I've not twirled them for a long time. You but had to I, I had to practice. I skinned my knuckles, but eventually I got to be able to twirl both of them. Let's see if I can still do it. You know, I've not done this for a long time. One. But then it's cocking them as well at the same time. Then, if I was clever, I can get them going two different directions. No, I can't. Well, I used to be able to. But... So, yes, they're... Um... They're amazing old things. And uh, it was through getting that that I discovered that uh, I actually quite enjoy shooting. I used to shoot when I was young, you know, air rifle in the garden. Um, and uh, I used to quite enjoy that. But um, a handgun is much nicer for me than rifle because I'm right handed, left eyed which means there's nothing you can do with a rifle really well. And I found I was a much better aim with a handgun than I am with a rifle. It's um, a a wonderful meditative thing. Have you ever shot a gun? It's this moment where you're on target and you make the mistake of lingering to make sure and you've lost it. <laughs> Happens every time. So when you get that still point, you have to squeeze. Exactly then, no thought. And uh, so it's it's really very interesting working like that. And um, I was talking to um, a touch and Rinpoche students one time, and uh, they were sort of a little bit troubled that uh, Buddhist teachers should be shooting weapons and... Uh, they were talking about them being um, bad things, you know. And I said, you know, this is really part of the Judeo-Christian mindset of God and the devil. But if there's a devil, then there are works of the devil and they're going to lead you into whatever. I said, this is not a Buddhist idea. This gun is an inanimate thing. It has no intentions. 
guns don't shoot people. People shoot people. They use guns to do that. But you could use a brick to do that or, 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 or whatever, an iron bar or... Or if you watch The Godfather, even a pair of spectacles. Do you remember that bit where he gets the spectacles and it goes into the eye and into the brain? I mean, no one designed the spectacles to do that, but I guess you could use them for that if you were skillful enough. You could say they didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, so then I said to them, well, what about archery? And they said, oh, archery's another matter. That's a peaceful sport. And I said, well, you know, tell the French Agincourt what a peaceful sport it was. The bow and arrow is a military weapon, or was. It's just not anymore. But, um, and wearing robes at the time, I said, besides, haven't you heard about the Buddhist right to bear arms? Oh, well, uh, I was sleeveless at the time, you see, so... But they finally accepted it was uh, all right. Uh, Tatum Roche came to stay with us in Penarth once. And, um, and in this house, in our old Yeah, in our old house. And once he heard we had a handgun there, it, it was an um, air gun, mm-hmm. which he really enjoyed shooting in the garden. And he said, um, he said, I have a gun back at my centre. He said, but I don't tell my students they don't like guns. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, uh, you know, th- 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 there are a lot of attitudes. You know, it's a package. Uh, one has to accept a package uh, mm. with whatever. You know, you can't be a free-thinking Tory. You can't be a free-thinking socialist. You've got to buy the packet. Mm. Um, and I remember in San Francisco there was a gay shooting club called the Pink Pistols. And the local council were trying to close them down. And the NRA, the the National Rifle Association, um, came to their defence. These men are our brothers. Now, a more homophobic group than the NRA, you can't imagine, but these men are our brothers, they shoot. And um, the uh, spokesperson, spokesman for the Pink Pistols said, uh, it's easier to tell other shooters I'm a gay than tell a, another gay I'm a shooter. He said, I didn't buy the package, you know, I, I, I'm just gay, you know. It, it doesn't mean I vote this way, vote that way, that, you know, uh, there is no package. But there's a Buddhist package too, you know, in the West, and, uh, uh, you know, in the Tricycle magazine some 10 years ago, they had a whole thing about you can't call yourself a Buddhist unless you're vegetarian. I think, well, that, that discounts the entire Tibetan population, you know, barring a few here and there over the centuries. Um, and how anyone's got the audacity to make a statement like that, you know. Uh, you know, as the converts to another religion, you know, laying down the law as to how it works... But the package is a big problem everywhere, you know. There's probably a humanitarian package, an atheist package. And so we like to try to encourage people not to buy the package. You know, buy what you want, mm-hmm. not the package. Think, think for yourself. Because that really corrupts people. They take on all kinds of things mm-hmm. that they might not really want to take on. And... Um, What's the difference between thinking for yourself and taking what you want and, say, a concept like integrity of a lineage or something like this? Um, It's it's like integrity to behaviour, really, because there's that psychological experiment, um, isn't there, where um, they got a group of people in and they had to give electric shocks to um, the victims on the instruction of a person in a white coat. So, and, and it seemed to be extremely difficult for people to resist that, the authority of the white coat and the fact that you were supposed to do it, this was the instruction. So, so that sort of um, tendency to animal realm behaviour, herd, herd-like mentality, leads you into... Um, 
behavior patterns that you wouldn't otherwise go into if you thought for yourself, if you thought with a degree of integrity to your, um, what you sent, what, what you thought was right and wrong. I think you, what we mean by the package is what is there in addition to the thing as advertised. <laughs> So you've got the Buddhism, but then you've got the package in which it exists. And people create parts mm. of the package. Mm. And there's a Western package that, that tends to go along with it that is not actually part of Buddhism at all. It's a package. It's like a set of programmed behaviors that go along mm. with, it might be clothing, ways of behaving. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> thought principles, it's almost like the thought police of, of the Buddhist Western world. So one has to be careful. I, had, I mean, I heard one student saying, I, you know, I, I thought this was a, a socialist sangha. I said, no, it, it's, it's, it's an apolitical sangha. If somebody's interested in the teaching, I mean, I'd accept a Tory as much as I'd accept anybody. They'd have to be interested in the teaching and they'd have to be Buddhist first, rather than Tory first. And on the same principle, they'd have to be Buddhist first and not socialist first. As long as you're Buddhist first, you can be a Buddhist, and then politics is simply a way of adjusting samsara. And there are things to be said within a moderate framework for either side. Um, I don't really see that... Uh, that one has to define Buddhism in political terms, especially in terms of political correctness. I mean, that, that doesn't really play. I remember Kunzang Dojo Rinpoche used to tease people <laughs> about that. Uh, there was one person who came from California, and um, he decided to tease him uh, on political terms, and he said, I think America should drop a nuclear bomb on China. And the poor man said, but a lot of innocent people would die. He said, yeah, a lot of guilty ones too. <laughs> just, the poor man was horrified until he, he realized Kunzo Toshubashi was just winding him up on the subject. <laughs> it was a rare find, this one. That's an early made class string tallies, or is that a custom job? They don't, it's a custom, it's a custom shop. This is a weird uh, thing about appreciation. I never liked the shape of a Telecaster. I never liked this horn thing here. Until one day I understood it. I realized this is not a horn. This is a cutout. And I suddenly realized it was entirely Art Deco. This straight line across here, and this plate here that looks like it came off a washing machine, you know, these knobs, it, it's, it's got a kind of a, a fabulous ugliness to it. I now love the things, it, but it, it, it flipped completely from not understanding the shape to getting an idea of it. It's... Uh, uh, if, if you choose to stay over, this is the this is the guest bedroom in here. Oh, savage cabbage! Yes, all all those people who bar the heads were posed by our son Robert. I just had photographs of the old band, their faces, and, um, and the whole thing's a Photoshop job. So R Robert just dressed up as the band members, held the guitars, and I photographed him and just worked it all into, into this. How many books have... You written now? I think about a dozen, I think. Mm. I've lost count. And the books we're working on as well. Uh, what are you working on at the moment? Um, we're working on um, a book on the 84 Mahasiddhas. 
Oh, cool. In four volumes, the stories um, from the Terma of uh, Jomo Pema Erzer. That's not a translation. That's a retelling. Yes. When, when I was with Konzang Don Rinpoche and he was telling me the stories of Zapaltrol, and he made an emphasis on telling me that I should tell the stories in a way that Western people would enjoy to hear them, in a Western style and not to copy a Tibetan style or his style. So, so that's what I did in the book, Wisdom Eccentrics, and that's what I do with the 84 Mahasiddhas as well. So um, there's the essential story, but then Kandra Dech and I have um, turned those into short stories in a relatively Western style. The stories are, are, are really fascinating in terms of how they bring out the Mahasiddha principle. Each one does it. The whole quality of the teacher working with the student is there. That is wonderful in these stories from um, Jomo Pema Erzea. You know, um, you know, the idiot is an idiot and he's taught as an idiot, but his quality as an idiot is, is worked with, you know, uh, and uh, which, which is... an advantage. Yes, it's the advantage mm. of being an idiot. Mm. And to work out what the advantage of being an idiot is, you've got to say, what's the opposite of an idiot? An intellectual is the opposite of an idiot. Then you have to look at what are the disadvantages of being an intellectual? You can twist anything. You know, you can find excuses for everything because you're so clever. You can be highly manipulative. An idiot's too stupid for that. Mm. So they're absolutely blunt and direct and will just do as they're told. Yeah. <laughs> and so this comes I know out. Questions. <laughs> just get on with it. So with each the Mahasiddha, the thief, the prostitute, everyone, that really comes out in these stories. So that's it's been Nice to um, clad these stories in, uh, with conversation, obviously, that wasn't in the stories, but to make them a believable um, um, account. Mm. Mm. Uh, and the nice thing about them is that they've, the practice instructions of the teacher to the disciple are very explicit. So the whole book becomes... A practice manual, mm. um, which is great. What's one of, I don't think that's been done before, has it? Fleshing them out in that in a, no. in a readable no. way like that. What's um, uh, what's one of your favourite of those stories, Kandra Um Ooh, yeah. I think the one about Shyama, the cloud weaver. Um, there are an, quite a few women in the stories in the Arrow Tear, um, as opposed to the um, no, more conventional set of Mahasiddha stories. Um, this one is about um, this lady who was just so vague that she couldn't really lead a functional life. She couldn't remember where she... Uh, she couldn't complete a task because she'd get distracted... Um, by marvelling at something whilst engaged in another activity. So she sort of drifted around in a very sort of vague way. Um, but when something caught her attention, it really did catch her attention. Um, and the whole gist of the story is that she meets her teacher um, because she gets lost. She wanders down the river and looks at the river and looks at the willow trees and looks at the water... And um, then she crosses over the river and she can't remember how to get home then because she turns in the wrong direction when she's trying to retrace her steps. And she um, meets a teacher who gives her instructions, very um, simple instructions on looking at the water and looking at the clouds and looking at the, um, the leaves moving in the wind on the branches and because these are things that she's naturally drawn to looking at anyway, they become her practice. And um, she doesn't get distracted. And so she achieves realisation through her um, 
concentration on on objects of nat- natural objects that um, natural things rather than having to complete a task or a sort of a conventional task shall we say first thing that one would think to do with someone like that would be to teach them to not get distracted mm. yeah I think that's one of the <clears throat> great differences between the Mahasiddha tradition of India and what existed later, because uh, Vajrayana was never really designed to be taught to hundreds of people in a room, or even 50 people in a room. Uh, it was one-to-one a lot of the time. And whenever you try to communicate anything to a group of people, uh, it becomes a group teaching, and a group teaching is essentially different from a one-to-one teaching. So that you're not uh, able to use the person's personality. You can only do that one-to-one. But that used to be essential to Vajrayana. That's where it began in India. And uh, it's lost that. It's lost that for various reasons, uh, largely political, largely in terms of uh, the predominance of, of a school, or a lineage needing to build monasteries. Um, And then once you have a monastery, you've got to maintain it, so you need an income. You see, the interesting thing, the word druptap or sadhana, uh, I'm not a Sanskrit scholar, but uh, the Tibetan word druptap means method of accomplishment. Uh, Now, if you use the word druptap, everybody thinks you mean a chanting text. And the chanting text is a druptap. It's not that it's not, but then picking your nose could be a druptap, or anything your teacher asks you to do could be a druptap. Uh, one of my favorite examples of that is not actually a Tibetan story, but a Zen story of the student who says to his teacher, I really need to achieve realization. He bugs his teacher about this sufficiently that the teacher says in the end, right, this is what you have to do. Um, Go up the road some 10 miles. There's a pig farm there. Work on the pig farm and, you know, come back in three years. So he works on the pig farm for three years, comes back. The teacher says, I think you need another three years on the pig farm. He goes back to work on the pig farm. After three years, he comes back. He says, maybe just another three years. He goes back again to work on the pig farm. But before the three years is over, the teacher says to his students for morning, um, we're going on a journey today. We're going to visit a friend of mine. He's a great master. He works on a pig farm. And so uh, this whole idea of druptab is, is there in that, that... Um, certainly, I mean, we teach Shine La Tong Yime Lundru just as you, well, Shamat Vipassana. Uh, the reason we don't use the Sanskrit words is because they have a particular meaning in Dzogchen, and Shamata, as it's practiced in Dzogchen, is not the same, so we call it Shine. It's very similar, but there are some important differences. I mean, sure, this is a standard practice that will achieve an end, but The thing is that you've already got your practice in who you are. That is your starting point. Now, I can ignore that starting point and say, right, this is what you do. Or I can take your starting point into account and work from there. Or this is what the Mahasiddha would do. Look at you and say, who are you? Where are you going? Usually these people are in trouble of some sort, and so they'd say, you know, I can help you. <laughs> and, and the help would be spiritual help rather than getting the gambler out of his awful situation or, or getting the thief out of his awful situation. But uh, they had a pressing need to do something different. Of course, it's very hard in this society to do that because we don't live in a society where we expect there to be masidas hanging around. That is not there for most ordinary people. Most of these siddhas were ordinary people 
who just stumbled on some Mahasiddha by accident. And the Mahasiddha happened to see that this person is at the right point that I could really help them in terms of exactly who they are. So naturally all these qualities of Shine, Latong, Nime, Lundrup, the Four Nile Jaws uh, are also part of how they taught, but they were the um, they were the tools rather than the main thing. They were aspects of how they taught. And so you can see those aspects coming out in terms of how Shyama was taught in terms of concentration, but in a very different way. It was not ignoring who she was. So that's, that comes out in all the stories. Um, what, what, what tends to come out of them is a sense in people hearing them that, oh, there's a chance for me then. I could do something, you know, that I, um, with all my foibles or, or however I'm constructed, there is a way of working, you know, and that, that's something I've got already in terms of being a moron. Um, I'm very fond of a moron because uh, I have an IQ of 66, which makes me officially a moron. Do you, do you know about that categorization? I think below 70 and you're a moron, so I, I, I wear that with pride. I don't think it would be called a moron these so, days, though. No, I, I know, but I just love the term, and so I can say I get my six with I get my kicks with an IQ of sixty six. Can I interrupt? Would it be good if we sat down? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's how you work with people in that more of that one on one orientation. Would you say or not? Or uh, I wouldn't like to give the impression that I was the we were saying we worked like the Mahasiddhas worked as if we were Mahasiddhas or anything. But there's a principle there that any teacher can employ if he or she is authentically interested in the development of an individual, you know, noticing uh, what their qualities are. And in order to do that, you have to spend enough time with a person. Um, I think it probably begins in being able to tease people and whether people will allow themselves to be teased or not. And it doesn't take much to be able to tell that. Some people just don't respond well, and then we stop, and then it just doesn't happen. We might try again a few years later and see if, if teasing works. Um, it's funny, teasing is a way of getting close to someone, isn't it? And also finding out how much awareness have they got of their own foibles. Yeah. You use that as a, as a, to test the ground for... Working with someone, in a way. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I think there are two kinds of teasing. There is um, teasing that's unkind and deliberately designed to get one over on somebody. Mm. It's Bri not the sort that would be belittle somebody. No, no. I mean, uh, British men like to tease each other, uh, and it's, it's deeply unpleasant. Uh, it's not what we do. We sort of more... Um, you can tease somebody about their qualities also, you know, that um, there's just a way of showing that you understand something about a person, that they're appreciated, mm -hmm. and that comes across. But um, if somebody has got an idea of themselves that they wish to project, then you can't tease them because they're putting that, uh, they're saying... Yeah. Here I am. Mm. <laughs> this is what you're looking at, you know, mm. and, and, you, and you have to take that away. Uh, and if they've got the screen up, there's not much you can do with that. Mm. So well, that blocks out all self-awareness. Mm. The screen. It seems that developing that ability to pre uh, appreciate the, diff the nuances of the people is linked to your use of appreciation in terms of compassion. Also, mm. oh. that you wouldn't, you'd have to. They would come hand in hand, Brad. Mm. Absolutely, yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Appreciation is like a... F it's almost like touching something. Only I don't mean touching, but it's perceptual touching, isn't it? So you're getting to know or to see something that you couldn't see um, without appreciation. What do you think obscures, typically, that ability to... 
touch through perception like that? Well, it's usually something to do with with um, my own um, self-referencing or um, the, the commentating that's going on constantly in the background that's getting in the way of me actually seeing something, hearing something, seeing things as they are. It's all to do with me and my big project. So I'm, I'm getting in the way. And does this lead in at all to the idea of Vajra romance? Appreciation is fundamental in terms of having um, a good relationship. And a, and a good relationship starts with courtship behaviour, where you're getting to know someone. That's what courtship is, isn't it? It's that, uh, that period of time before you're sure of what the other person's feeling. And so you don't really know whether this relationship is on or not. But in terms of the Vajra romance, we talk about the nyam of reflection. Um, where you, This is the nyam of falling in love. And that really is based on each, each partner's appreciation or each aspect of the couple's appreciation for each other. So it's, it's, getting, to, it's getting that connection. If there's someone that you've, uh, someone who you've known for a while, and you've been aware of their appearance, uh, either crooked teeth, a broken nose, or, 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 or one eye is larger than the other, or, or they're wide apart, or they're they look peculiar in some way. Now, the interesting thing is that that. If by some accident you fall in love with that person, then all those things become attractive. This is not some revolutionary idea. I think most people will, will have been aware of this. And um, because sometime after they fall out of love and they're with a new partner, they look back at that person and think, oh, God, it's all come back again, that, those crooked teeth. Oh, I don't like those. And you, but you liked them for that period. And it, it's that liking, that appreciation that gets sparked that is really interesting, that is similar in some ways to the Telecaster. I didn't like the look of it until I understood it. I thought, this is Art Deco, you know, and suddenly the whole thing made sense to me. You know, it's like the um, um, tricone that, I never really liked the grill work on it. I'll, I'll hook it down. Well, I'll hook it up, actually. It's, uh, it's, um, I like the sound of the thing, but I never liked the fact that it had this basket work on it. I thought, basket work does not belong on a guitar. I didn't like the fact that there was a triangle set like that in the middle of it until I realised that it's the Chrysler building. <laughs> this is just a small Chrysler building and it's Art Deco. And I thought, now I understand it. Only in Art Deco would you do something like this. And then it was understood. It's kind of remarkable. It's not that there always has to be an, an understanding you can explain. I'm making it sound as if, as if that's important, but it's actually not that when you come to like a thing, you just like it. You know, that's, um... that's the same in romance. Yes. Um, you can't explain why you fall in love with someone. That's a mystery. I think there's a suspicion about falling in love, that it's a sort of a, a kind of being gripped with a mixture of intoxication and projection, and that one, when one emerges from the so-called honeymoon period, and you think, who is this person? I don't actually like you, without the uh, hormonal cocktail of the infatuation. How is what you're describing, the, the falling in love of the Vajra romance, that phase, different from that description of it? Well, there are two things that happen... Uh, more or less simultaneously. Uh, what happens as described in the books, I can almost quote the first one I saw with which I was horrified, that uh, love is a relatively harmless pathology 
which, when it's exhausted, the real work of the relationship starts. I read this in a bookshop in Walnut Grove, California, uh, about to give a talk, and they put me next to a trolley with new books on it, and it happened to be a romance that was on at the moment. I, I, I leafed through them, and they have more, more or less all said this. And um, that's when we decided that we would start teaching on Kandra Pao Nida Melongyud because we thought this can't be the only information out there for people. This is depressing material. Not that it's wrong, but it's only part of the story. It's also true that we're attracted to each other by virtue of having similar neuroses, similar dysfunctional families. We're not saying this is not true. That is there. But there's also something else that happens at the same time, and that is the nyam of Kandra power reflection. And those things are independent. Both happen. Uh, usually what they describe in the books is what dominates. Unless you prioritize courtship behavior. If you prioritize courtship behavior, you actually have to practice Buddhism. You have to be kind and open. You can't be unpleasant and closed-minded. That's not going to attract anybody or keep anybody, so you're obliged to keep up that practice. If you decide simply to keep it up, it, it's endless. And of course, um, if you're both working at it equally, then you're inspired to your best behavior. So the whole thing starts working and you start discovering more and more that is actually admirable about the other person and you start to appreciate the way that they are actually inciting your better behavior and that when you act in ways that are not so wonderful you don't feel good about it and you're apt to apologize for it and correct your behavior so i can go in one of two directions um if you're not able to enter into that, then of course you go the way that, you know, then you're into arbitration. I'll do this if you do that. Um, then it's all gone. But, but there is this nyam that Kandradation was mentioning. This is something that exists uh, in another aspect of being that's got nothing to do with conditioning. So it erupts out from behind the screen of conditioning. And if you latch into that, I, it, it, it gets too involved here to explain it. I mean, there's a book about that thick we've written on it. That, so uh, we're having to finger paint here. But you know, in terms of explaining how that happens is really quite technical. The practice is quite simple, but its background or its underpinning is extremely complex but it deals with the Tsalung system. It deals with that subtle level of energy and a nyam called uh, uh, um, Chalame, which is a particular kind of energy that one has. More of it when one's young, which is why falling in love with the first time is always highly explosive because the Chalame has not become uh, distorted. But um, one can't rely on that energy in terms of facilitating a relationship that is a practice. Uh, you know, you're through entering into that experience of Tralame and cooperating with it. Uh, because all practice is basically is cooperating with non-dual reality. That's what Shine is, that's what Latong is. It's a form of cooperating with what naturally occurs. You mentioned there to prioritize practice of courtship or courtship behavior yes. over over what and so, what how would you define courtship behavior um, kindness and openness and you would be prioritizing it over the neurotic aspect over um, the me project 
that <coughs> becomes slightly more ephemeral in the background if one prioritizes courtship behavior because you're being open. So you're saying yes to your partner. Yeah, I'll do that. And you're also being kind. You're doing spontaneous, kindly actions. I'll go and get him a bunch of flowers or whatever his bunch of flowers is. <laughs> so um, those are the two aspects of Buddhist practice. Uh, openness being wisdom and kindness mm. being compassion. And that's, in, that's entered into entirely by the accident of romance. Falling in love actually makes you do that naturally without even having to think about it, mm. which is, is, that's quite amazing, really. I mean, we do have spontaneous kindness, of course we have. Every, everything that makes you smile, everything that makes you want to do something for someone spontaneously is, is one's non-dual nature sparkling through. But this is, when it happens in a couple and you're both doing it, then it kind of becomes mm. um, slightly more um, like a fire burning, yeah. something catching fire yeah. in, um, in terms of its energy. It also challenges, uh, uh, well, it, 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 it tends to break patterns to uh, a story. It's, this has never happened to me um, yet, I'm glad to say. But uh, one's in this romantic situation, you're sitting there, after the nice meal and you're talking and uh, and this wonderful person says to me uh, do you like ABBA and I say um, being the diplomat that I am I've never really listened to them that much uh, and then she says um, I've got all their albums would you like to hear one and I say yeah all right then <laughs> And she puts it on, and I start listening, and I say, you know, I've never really listened to them this way before, and of course I haven't. And I start hearing things that are not entirely unpleasant. I say, fortunately, this has never happened to me, because I'm just choosing the most horrendous scenario I can think of. Actually, the Bee Gees could be slightly worse, but... Um... So it, it breaks those patterns, I mean, you know... You're, you... And that's broken naturally. It's not that you're being manipulative no. and saying, I really like Abba. It's really happening to you. And you, something magical's happened that you're perceiving in a different way. What is the difference between riding the momentum of that uh, in, a re in a relationship and, in a certain sense, commodifying the relationship in the me project? What I've seen sometimes is... People say they take the relationship as a spiritual practice, but it ends up being a sort of a mutual rejection of each other, a pairing of people who are basically leveraging each other in order to change. Well, that wouldn't be my definition of being in love with someone, mm. because you'd be um, you'd be entering a relationship with um, some sort of prior plan, which would be to self-serve. So. That's not what we're describing in the nature of romance no. at all. What's the difference then between an, uh, g giving somebody their flowers from a place of kindness, aware that it's also a practice, and being nice to somebody, giving them their flowers, as a means of leveraging that act for practice? You only have to really think about the practice of it when you become aware you've not been practicing it for a while. Yeah, when you've slipped. <laughs> but when you're practicing it, you don't have that self-awareness of it. These yeah. things occur spontaneously. You know, it's like, you know, in the early stages of a romance, your, your partner says, um, um, oh, I, I've got to help my aunt move her furniture from Inverness. Do you fancy coming with me? on the weekend when you just spend all week at work. And you say, sure, yeah. Uh, you know, that's, oh, I must do this as a practice. Mm. It doesn't come into it. Mm. Um, it's a bit like if you were practising silent sitting meditation um, and you'd be thinking very rigidly, I've got to keep sitting upright, I have to keep my spine erect, I have to be erect, I have to be erect. 
that will be the equivalent mm. in formal practice. Um, and actually, you just have to let go and relax and let be. Otherwise, it's just more and more self-referentiality. -referen so it's always me-centred, me bouncing off the world, and, and it would be like me bouncing into a relationship, and it would still be more me, me, me. Um, so you wouldn't be thinking about it like that. How, how would one undermine that chronic me-centredness, whether it's in the silent sitting or in relationship? I think the whole idea of me or I as a problem is, to a certain extent, sutrayana-based. Uh, the emphasis with sutrayana is to realize the I is not there. Um, there was a certain time when I was teaching and people were very keen on this I business and, uh, and somebody said to me, so um, with this visualization then, who, who's doing the visualization? And I said, who's asking the question? Who's hearing it? <laughs> you can't proceed like that, you know. And I, I, it, it made me feel that I'd like to give a teaching. I've never done this yet, but it was called Come Back Ego, All is Forgiven. Um, um, the non-existence of the uh, Atman um, is its non-existence as a project. It's not to say there's nothing there, it just doesn't continue so this I is there every moment, but it's not there in the next and not in the one before. It's just now. And if you try to locate it now, you can't find it anyway. So there's not really such a concern about the me project in terms of Vajrayana, apart from uh, self-obsession, which is also a process. But... Um, uh, the whole Vajrayana point of view is a lot more relaxed about this I business. It's not central anymore because once, what, you know, Vajrayana is based on emptiness. That's the starting point. Mm -hmm. I, I think actually that is something that ought to be emphasized a little bit more with the people who are practicing because if you haven't, uh, uh, if you haven't stabilized Shinhe to a certain extent, I mean, how are you practicing Vajrayana? I mean, you can't be. To practice Vajrayana with no experience of emptiness is meaningless. It's, it's, it's actually pretty much a new age activity where you're engaging in acts of fantasy. So there has to be emptiness there. And once that experience is there, you know, then, the, then the fact that I am here is not such a problem because I is not such a great big solid thing. So from that, um, these teachings on, um, on Vajra romance are based on emptiness. So that's the main reason that the me project or the I project is not really... A serious question there. Uh, it, it is if you haven't had that experience. But of course, that, you know, romance itself tends to encourage um, a certain degree of selflessness. If you want it all to work, you have to put yourself second. And in the romantic situation, that happens quite naturally. Mm. You know, will you do this for me? Sure. You know, it's not a moment's thought there. Will it be inconvenient? Yes, of course it will. <laughs> but that doesn't matter. Mm. Um, now, of course, it really becomes a practice when it starts to slip. Now, the emptiness that exists uh, that facilitates the romantic behavior, the courtship behavior, is the thought of possible loss. So the first main problem occurs when commitment is established when there's no fear of loss where's the emptiness that has to be found somewhere else in order to continually ignite the practice 
Otherwise, it can begin to fall apart at that point. So, of course, the emptiness there is more the practice of being with another person and allowing yourself to be either challenged or threatened by that person. That is not that the person deliberately challenges you or threatens you, but that you have to seek out that challenge or threat from the being of the other. So this is another aspect of the practice, that the Kandradechan has different ideas to mind. She wants the, the yuletide tree here rather than there. And I think, oh, there, right. Um, what do I do about that? Well, we happen to agree on this position, by the way, but um, <laughs> if, we, if we hadn't have done, it would have been interesting. <laughs> what, um, would have, what would have happened then? Um, we would have listened to each other. Yeah. <laughs> what else could happen? <laughs> and what's the loss that's, that's looming there in terms of emptiness in, in that example? Loss of where I wanted it. Yeah, <laughs> loss of your idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought we'd have it there. And so, so that's the only place for it. <laughs> so if we have a difference of opinion on something, it's intriguing. Because I, I, I immediately know, all right, well, I, I've got something here that I'd like to do, and the contradiction has got another idea, and um, so my idea is under threat here. Well, um, well, right then. So we tend to look for what's preferable about each other's mm. option rather than mm. going for our own. But, uh, the thing is, though, if you if you're in this sort of relationship where you know your partner is really considering seriously what you want to do, you're actually quite tentative then about the way you need to assert, or the way you would choose to assert your opinion mm. because you, you realise that you're in a very powerful place and you don't want to abuse that. So you're quite tentative or... or you know, this is one aspect of the practice. The, 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 it's a sort of um, an end result of that is that you are less um, latched on to your idea that you want it to be this way. This is why the basis of emptiness is there, because you're coming in and you're going out and you're coming in. So it's a dance. It's not formulaic and it's not, well, I'll do that if you do this. Um, so it's not, well, that's what you meant by arbitration. Mm -hmm. It's not negotiated. It happens. It's the natural efflorescence of that sort of relationship. It happens in that way. What's the difference between that sort of thing and a codependence or martyrdom sort of situation? What's the second word? M martyrdom. Oh, martyrdom. Making oneself a martyr. By, I... by in other words, constantly prioritising the other person in a certain way that well, I think that what we have to look at here again is that in terms of this being a Vajrayana teaching, those things just simply don't apply. Uh, they apply in everyday life, but this is not really ever considered to be a practice for the average human being, although there are things that the average human being could learn from it, but... These these are dangers for the non-practitioner. Uh, practitioners aren't, aren't martyrs, or if they are, they're not practitioners. Uh, not that there couldn't be a, a practitioner, like a Mahasiddha, who was deliberately a martyr. That works. I, I, I read some Sufi story once about the man who had the teacher... Who, with the harridan of a wife who, and so he thought he'd do the same and marry some harridan and, and ended up saying well, what made you think you could do this <laughs> uh, it was quite an interesting story you know, that you can't emulate it but apart from that um, one can't really look at those things that happen uh, uh, because one's practicing this equally one is practicing it um, from the position of having a teacher. Although one's partner is one's teacher, one also has a teacher who would observe the situation. Um, I think 
the desire for martyrdom would be undermined by all kinds of practice anyway. So uh, that would really only come into it if, if one wasn't a practitioner. So this isn't a sort of relationship advice, the ideal way to have a relationship, sort of Buddhist style. No. No, no definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Both no. partners have to be practising. It's not something you could take on as an individual in a couple. I, I, I remember some psychotherapists who attended uh, teaching that we gave all this, getting very upset about this material and saying it was dangerous, you know, and whatever, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And we had to keep on saying, you know, we did say this is for practitioners. Mm -hmm. This is not for the average person. The average person could try aspects of it out and it would be beneficial in, in many contexts. Except, you know, one thing we'd say is that uh, being a martyr is not a compassionate act because you're allowing somebody to abuse you. Dominate you. And that is no good for the person who's abusing you. It may be no good for you, but it's no good for the person who's abusing you either. And that is just facilitating mm. a bad mind state in, in another person. So one would not do that. Mm. But, but it's not a pop psychology. No. That, I mean, that's not to say that you wouldn't see um, people who have good relationships would be displaying these aspects of behaviour that we've been describing. So it's not that people don't fall into it accidentally, because they do. Um, <laughs> Vata romances aren't the only good relationships on the planet. <laughs> I would not like to suggest it as a, as a one-size-fits-all. It can't work like that. You know, it, it, it has to be mutual and it has to be understood. It's not actually even reliant on perfect behavior all the time. But one has to have that sense of, um, I don't want to be the badly behaved person. I want to be the well-behaved person. That's what I actually want. And so when I'm reminded, I will be grateful of that because that's actually what I want to be, you know, um, and that's really how one has to be working. Uh, that's the only work involved, otherwise it's delightful. Um, you know, for practitioners, it should be uh, more delightful than not, apart from external pressures which, which you know, do whatever they do. How then, when you work with your students, do you bring someone to that realisation of emptiness or... Uh, to the place where they might be able to embark on the Vajrayana? It's mainly Shine. Um, and, I mean, it's Shine as a formal practice. Uh, as an informal practice, it's their life circumstances and their attitudes and their, their, their patterning, whatever that patterning happens to be. Largely when they run into trouble with it. I mean, we don't pick people up on their innocuous patterning, but where it's noxious, we'll remind them of it. And then it's a practice of emptiness, simply letting go of that or trying to let go of it. Could you talk a bit about what shine is or what that, what, how one would practice shine? Shine is simply sitting... Um, in any comfortable position and um, letting go of thought, of being uninvolved with it. And whenever one catches oneself involved, one simply stops. So it's stopping all the time. I'm involved, I let go. I'm involved again, I let go again. It's extremely boring. I think one one has to be prepared for that boredom mm -hmm. and pushing through that and knowing that the boredom is just um, uh, one's identity wishing to press itself. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm not defined here. I've got to think in order to be defined. So, so that's the main thing, really. Um, as a formal practice... Um, 
as a practice of everyday life in terms of um, well, there's emptiness all the time mm. about... Well, that was like emptiness before we met you. Um, before we got started, we didn't know what you were going to ask us, really. You didn't know what we were going to be like. <laughs> we didn't know what form it would take, did we? So that was a practice of emptiness for all of us. Oh, well, it wasn't unpleasant, but it was empty, wasn't it? And so people really have to practice, uh, mm. they have to recognise mm. life as shine. Mm. Shine and latong. Mm. I've stopped being this, I've become that. Mm. How would I say, a practice shine in that moment, as the train's coming, the meet, we're about to meet? Do you just uh, allow that notice. to play? You just notice. Mm. Most of it is noticing. And, uh, not trying to make it all right. Mm. That's making it into form. Mm. It'll be fine. Um. And there's all sorts of peculiar ways that we make it all right, like we might laugh a lot. And that's, that's what uh, someone might do, a grinagogue might do in that situation. Mm. Would that be the sort of thing you might point to if someone was working with you? Their tendency to laugh as a way of... We've not mm. yet... Um, you have to be careful. <laughs> mo- most of uh, the grinagogues we know would be too sensitive to mm. bring that up, uh, I'd We say. might talk about it, but not in relation to that individual. We might use that as an aspect, um, just like I did then. Just mm. it, it can be many things that we will use to fill that nervousness, you know? That emptiness. I think grinagog is a word that, that ought to return to uh, everyday speech because uh, it defines certain people. And I think if they were even aware there was a word for it. Uh, I went shopping this morning. Ha 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 ha. Um, I, I bought some carrots. Ha 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 ha. Uh, <laughs> what this starts happening, you. you and you think, well, there's no humour in this. Why are you laughing? Um, there's one of the uh, Mahasiddhas, in fact, who's a Grinagog, the Grinagog mathematician, which is a fascinating story. It's, uh... But the, the ones we've come across, we wouldn't bring it up with them. Because it's too destabilising. Mm-hmm. How did your teachers work with you in those sorts of... Uh in those sorts of ways. You're talking about pointing out certain things in life, mm-hmm. behaviours and so on. Oh, Chim Rizman uh, is the prime example of this. The way he made me responsible for what I said so that I stopped saying things to please people. Uh, the main story of this is the desktop fan. It was in Holland... Um, and he used to go once a week to a flea market and he'd buy clothes there for Tibetan refugee children. He'd parcel them up and get them shipped off to India. And, um, he came back with a desktop, uh, with, a, with a projector. Uh-huh. Uh, it was a cheap projector. Uh, it didn't work. Um, the bulb didn't work, it was broken in various ways. And uh, uh, knowing that I was a photographer, he said, uh, what do you think of this? Now, I had enough experience of him to say, um, uh, it's a piece of rubbish, Rinpoche. Yeah? Why you say this? I said, well, it doesn't work. <laughs> the light doesn't work. It's, uh, the, the carriage is, it, it doesn't function. And so I plugged it in, the fan started. I said, well, I guess the fan works. He said, something can be done with this. And I thought, oh, God, he's got me already. I said, I guess you could do something with it. Uh, what, what doing? I said, well, I guess you could take it out and make a desktop fan out of it or something. He said, you can do this. And I thought, oh, God, I've got to say yes. If I say no, he'd say, then why you say this, you know, idiot? You know? So I said, well, uh, I told him it was worthless also. 
That's an important part of it. I thought I was doing really well. It's rubbish. It's worthless. So I said, well, I would need to buy some tools. No, no money spending. You worthless saying. So no money spending. So then I had to make this desktop fan with a, with a bread knife from a piece of mahogany in the garden that, that was part of some old wardrobe that had been thrown out. I had to cut the plastic cowling with a heated up knife that could go through it, and I got a bit, and I, I cut out the um, a sort of a mahogany base to fit in the bottom. Um, no vice. I had to stand on the wood and carve it with a bread knife, and my hands were bleeding by the end of it, because every time I slipped, I'd, I'd wrap my knuckles on the stone. So I, I, I eventually carve it out, and I, I, I've got a screwdriver, a small screwdriver, and I get screws out of the body of the uh, projector, and I, I fix the fan in, I put little holes in the back, I put a piece of perforated zinc in the front that I bend round and screw in, I use the little rubber grommets so the cable goes into the little motor inside, and so I, I, I give it to him. There it, is from, it took me a week to make this thing. Horrible. Just hours of toil on this, and it was ugly. It was a vile-looking little thing. So I say, here, I'm ashamed. And he looks at it. He plugs it in. It works. Yeah, good. He wraps it up and puts it in the suitcase, and that's it. Yeah, good. That's all the thanks I got for this thing. So I thought, well, I wasn't doing this for thanks anyway, so fine. So that's the first part of the story. Um, some years later, I meet... Um, a rather unpleasant individual in Dharamsala, Upper Dharamsala. Um, he was the kind of individual who'd be friendly when he was poor. <laughs> and uh, he was in want of a meal, and so I thought, well, let's, let's, be, um, let's be a Buddhist about this and um, take him out for a meal. I can do that. I needn't hold grudges, need I? No, <laughs> not me. <laughs> So we go out for a meal, and I say, so okay, I, I knew he'd spent time with Chimurigs and Rinpoche. I, I won't mention his name. But, um, and apparently he'd throw, uh, Chimurigs and Rinpoche had thrown him out. And I said, so what was it like there? And, oh, he said, yeah, it's a nice shrine room. He said, but he was always blowing incense into my face with this nasty little fan on his desk. And I said, what was that fan like? He said, a nasty grey little thing with perforated zinc in the front. And I said, oh, right. <laughs> That's very funny, you know. I, I I didn't say anything about it, and I thought, well, after all the nasty things this gentleman had done to me over the years, I thought, oh, at least Chimurizum got him back for it. You know, he said he used to be choking on incense, and he'd sort of drive the incense towards him with his fan. About a year later, I ran into Chimurizum Rinpoche again. We were spending time together, and I said, oh, I met such a body, and he was telling me about this fan. He said, ah, oh, yeah, that was so funny. He choking, much choking. <laughs> and he's, uh, and cause I told him about this because I wanted to admit my shameful feelings of glee that my little fan had made him choke, you see. But he didn't think that was any, in any way interesting. He said, oh, much deserving, he said. <laughs> so that's the whole story. And it went on for oh, almost six years from stage to stage of the thing and he was always working with me in that way that he'd seen that I had an apron that I'd made for myself with pockets in it and uh, he said you like this one making and I said yes Rinpoche sure I'll make one like that for you he said but big pocket you know I said I mean gussets in it, you know, to make them stand out. Oh, yes, good. So he said, and um, also at the back, front and back, and pockets, front and back, big, long pockets. I said, yeah, well, how long the pockets? He said, this long. Huh? So there was this strange thing I made him, and he called it uh, the kangaroo. And um, he said, you having this done um, uh, in July? And I said, I can't do that, I'm afraid. 
I said I can have it ready in August, but not July. And so he really pressured me for getting it in August. And I thought, no, this time I'm standing my ground. I said, I can try Rinpoche, but I cannot promise. Because I keep my promises and I cannot promise I can try. And so he tried anyway to get a promise out of me. And this time I said, no, I can't promise because I don't want to break my promise. I will try. Can't promise. So... I eventually finished it in July, posted it to him and said, promised in aura in August, delivered in July. And he never did that to me again after that. So it was really quite funny. He, he just wanted me to stand my ground. And what I was saying had to be reasonable that I could not finish it, in my opinion, in July. That I was not willing to make that a promise. Even though I tried, I couldn't put a promise on it. And he was always getting me to do that, so that what I said, you had to count on what I said, and I had to know what I was saying, etc. I can't, so many times he did that to me <laughs> before I learned the lesson. Which was? That um, I shouldn't try to please people with what I said, and that I should say what I mean and mean what I say. And so that was extremely helpful. You know, that, uh... The other one was when he... Uh, his, his biggest insult to me was, you one big diplomat. Um, this was in Geneva, I think. Yeah, Geneva. And the, there was a man there who was... It was a wealthy fellow who'd um, invented sophrology, which was a a combination of philosophy and theology or something of that nature. Um, and he was having a discussion with Shimaruz and Rinpoche. He, li- he loved to come there and talk to him and about the fact that plants are sentient. And there was this argument going on and he was saying, well, uh, plants are sentient because if you get one plant and you do this, it, the, the other plant reacts and then Jim Rishan Rishi said well you do this to, to a machine and it reacts what's the difference and this was his argument and so he said he says uh, he said not for Chugim what are you saying and I said well I, I don't know Rishi I said I said oh you you one big diplomat he said you tantric man you must be knowing so I said, all right then. I said, I, 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 I'd say they have sentience. He said, why saying? And I said, well, I said, uh, as you said, a machine will respond if you do this. But machines were created to do that. As I'm a tantric man, I don't believe in God. So if there's no God to design them to do that, that means they're sentient. You have to believe in God for plants not to be sentient. If they respond, they're not designed. And so the uh, master of sophrology said, so, what do you say now? And Shimmerush and Shri just burst out laughing, and that was the end of it. But it was, uh, he liked to put me on the spot that I was supposed to help him um, um, uh, teach in Frankfurt because the woman there was worried about his English because his English is not easy to understand. Um, when I repeat things he says, I usually talk like Yoda because that's how Tibetans speak, you know, um, verb at the end. Verb always at the end coming. <laughs> so... Uh, he was giving some teaching on Tonglen and he said, now you something say for an hour. So I launched in immediately and started covering some aspect of what he was teaching. But wound it up in a way that I thought was fairly neat and concise at the end and stopped. He said, still five minutes coming. 
So in addition to... <laughs> just had to launch in for five minutes, and I knew it could only be five minutes, and I had to say something intelligent and useful in five minutes when I'd already concluded, and he'd do that too. And so that um, was really valuable, uncomfortable, but incredibly valuable. Crazy wisdom is Chögyam Trungpa Rinpoche's word. It's his coinage. Um, uh, I've always used it up to recently. Now we, we use the Tibetan Yeshi Cholwa because crazy wisdom is not a translation. It's not a literal translation. Yeshe is primordial wisdom. Ye, primordial she, knowing. Uh, Cholwa means chaos. So there's no crazy in that. So it basically means uh, wisdom chaos or primordial wisdom chaos. The aspect of chaos is that which uh, offends pattern. It offends the pattern of duality, even the religious pattern of duality. So hence, crazy wisdom or yeshi cholwa. Um, now, there's an area of confusion that has arisen even with uh, Tibetan lamas as to the nature of two particular modes of unconventional behavior. One is called Yeshi Cholwa, which is connected with Dzogchen. The other one is Myun Haruka, which Myun is actually crazy. That's, that's the word, and Haruka or Traktung is blood drinker. Uh, Traktung is, is the word used, or Haruka, about wrathful awareness beings. Now, Myun Haruka uh, is shocking. It's different from Yeshi Cholwa. It's shocking because it turns things upside down. And it has a great deal in connection with overcoming the pure, impure dichotomy. So there's a lot of uh, snake and scorpion eating goes on. Uh, you know, the five meats, the five nectars, uh, taking those as actual, perhaps, so there's excrement, pus, urine, feces, whatever, uh, you know, the five meats, horse, etc., pig, human meat, uh, these are things that could be eaten. Mostly it's symbolic, but um, um, lamas such as Drupa Kunle would be Nyon Haruka. They would act outrageously they would overturn social mores. This is very much Myon Haruka. This is different from Yeshi Cholwa. Yeshi Cholwa does not set out to shock. It, it, it may shock, but it has no intention of shocking. I would say it has more, it's more akin to some kind of Vajra whimsy that the person simply does not accord with formula in any way. Now, that need not be shocking. Uh, I might, uh, fortunately, I'm not a crazy wisdom master, I might hold you, uh, pass you an envelope stuffed with 50-pound notes and say, oh, you can have that. Uh, if that might be shocking, but it might be pleasurable also. Um, so Yeshi Cholwa is really something that is, um, you can't really explain what it is as you can explain what Myon Haruka is. That's quite easy to explain. You can look at, at lamas such as Drukpa Kunle. You can look at, at Chögyam Trungpa Rinpoche as well and say, they conform to that model. But Yeshi Cholwa does not conform to any model at all. And I think particularly it has nothing to do with predictable behavior. So sexually abusing students is not Yeshi Cholwa, uh, primarily because it's predictable. 
that people in positions of power who abuse positions of power, what they do is predictable. Now, how is this crazy? This is highly predictable. Uh, financial abuse is highly predictable. So if it's predictable, it's not Yeshi Chorwa. Yeshi Chorwa has to be unpredictable. I, I, I always remember Chimerigs and Rinpoche in the middle of a, a, a Bado Turdol empowerment with his uh, bell and Damaru, he's chanting, and he suddenly sniffs his armpit and says, Somebody once told me I smelt. Do you think I smell? And then he just continued. I was sitting there and I thought, did I just drift off and have a daydream there or did that actually happen? So I turned to the gentleman next to me and I said, did you? He said, yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, he, he'd never done it before. He never did it afterwards. So it wasn't a habit of his to do that. So I always used to describe him as unpredictably unpredictable. He would just come out of left field. Excuse the Americanism, but um, he would do things that were just... You just didn't understand them at all. And they weren't particularly shocking. They were just strange, completely. What was that question you once asked you about women, about orgasms? Oh, yes. That was... Um, <laughs> I think it was when you were introducing me to him yeah. but as your girlfriend we were in, I yeah. think I'd met him before but we're now in a different relationship and um, he he said to me do women ejaculate do you think women ejaculate <laughs> and um, obviously it was complete emptiness experience he hadn't said anything else to me <laughs> in fact I don't think I'd ever he'd ever said anything personally to me before that anyway so I said, yes, yes, I think they do. <laughs> and then we just passed into normal conversation after that. Uh, I, I'd, never, by. I'd never heard him ever ask anyone a question like that before. It was extraordinary. And then there was a gentleman once who was dying of cancer. And there was this whole... Oh, this was outrageous. Um, there was a whole discussion going on as to whether he was going to die. And some people thought he was going to die, others didn't, and then... And this uh, was at a public teaching. A public teaching. Uh, and then he said, I say a jita does not die. And, um, and then he asked me what I thought, and I said, well, uh, a, a jita can't die, because a jita means deathless, you see. So he was just making a joke. The whole thing was a joke, but... I don't think anyone understood it. They just found it bewildering. And, uh, but the interesting thing was that Ajita himself understood the joke. And um, so it was basically for him. And the only way I could understand it in the end was that it was a deeply touching and intimate joke that it was something to make him smile, you know, that it was a play with his name and that that's what it was all about. But, um, but and I had to take that as sort of a personal teaching to me because at the time I was um, a hospice care nurse. And, uh, I mean, obviously well aware of the fact that you have these conversations about dying and death and that they should be there, but not in public setting, not like that and I remember talking to you on, on the train yeah. on the way home saying, he can't do things like that <laughs> but that was just my set ideas of how yeah. things, or it was, it was my perception of the event, I wasn't perceiving it as a personal thing between them yeah, you could see him, sm I could see him smiling at the back because he, he knew it was a joke and that um, he didn't have much time left to find anything funny but so that was, yeah. the, he, he appreciated the humour of it. Mm. Yeah. So. And it was also an example of how he did want people to speak their minds because he asked you, didn't mm. he, what you thought. And you said that he can't die. And then he asked me, and I knew he was going to die. And I knew I, would, I should have said he's going to die. Cause, but I didn't because I couldn't because it was public and it was 
It was one of those situations I just wanted to cringe and die. <laughs> so I said, I say, same like him. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so I can be <laughs> cut. <laughs> yeah, he... Yeah. Um, the next thing, I'm in London, I go to see Jim Rose and Boucher, and I said, well, I, I, I think I will tell you that, um, you know, Dej and I are, are, you know, getting together, you know, but just, just to let you know, but, but we're not telling anybody at the moment, it, it's a secret, it's uh, only you know this, right? By the time I get to Cardiff, everybody in Cardiff knows. It, it took that long for him to just broadcast it. So we were sort of used to him doing things like this. And, uh, 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 why it was particularly that he didn't want us having a secret, I have no idea. I, I, I never asked him. But um, it was very funny when we found out. And it was somewhat of a relief, too, because we thought, well, we, that's just what's happening. So, um, yes, crazy wisdom. He He, he, he sort of veered between Mion Haruka and Yeshi Cholwa in his manifestations. It's not that you have to book on to use one or the other, but those are the two modes, and they get confused with each other. And um, one lama who understands this is Tuku Dagpa Rinpoche, and he, was, uh, he, in fact, told Bacha, one of our students, that not many people understand this differentiation and that most people think of it as Mion Haruka, the, the shocking behavior. But, but you know, yet neither are called crazy wisdom. That's sort of a split between them. The crazy belongs to the Mion Haruka, not to the Yeshi Cholwa, the Dzogchen mode, that simply primordial wisdom chaos. And the chaos is not that you create chaos, but simply that it doesn't accord to any pattern. It doesn't accord to a religious pattern either. So it doesn't accord to renunciation, that one doesn't necessarily look like a renunciate, um, because that's as much of a fashion as anything else. What's the effect over time of being exposed to that sort of a person? Well, it was only for relatively short periods with Chimuris and Rupeshe. Um It's hard to say, really. Um, when you're involved with something to such a degree that it's, it's your entire life, then it's simply the experience you're having. I wouldn't know what somebody else's experience was. I think it would depend why, why you were doing it. I mean, I, I think that I actively wanted him to mess with me. I think if you're messed with uh, and it's something that you don't want or haven't agreed to in yourself, it's another thing. Uh, the reason I decided to ask him to be my teacher for a period of time, because Kunzang Dozh Rinpoche had told me there'll be a period where we won't see each other for 12 or 13 years. And in that time, you should study with, he, he gave me a list of different lamas, and um, uh, Chimarugsa Rinpoche was one of them. He also mentioned Chagdud Tulku and, and a few other lamas, but it uh, I just so happened that I'd already met Chimarugsa Rinpoche, and I thought, yes, I'd like to study with him. And uh, the reason was because he, we uh, entertained him to dinner. Uh, Kandradesh and I weren't together at that particular point. This was earlier. And um, I, I got in a Chinese meal, and a nice Chinese meal for, for him and his daughter. And um, I also got in some cheese, because I, I, I know he likes cheese. And I, I, uh, part of it, I got Stilton, and I got an entire round of, em of uh, brie, about this large, about that thick. Because I thought, however much anyone likes brie, there'll be some for me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so after the, after lunch, Chimuru Zimshay cut himself off a little piece of brie, had the brie and said, this is very good. He then picked up the whole round and ate it, all of it. And it was then that I thought, oh, you really are going to mess with me, aren't you? <laughs> you're, you're obviously the ideal teacher. So um, it didn't stop there, though. Then we went on to the place in Bristol where... 
he wanted me to take my slides and give a slideshow. And then he comment on the slides. And uh, he got them to melt down the Stilton that I'd bought as well. So they melted it, and he asked me to go out and buy chilies. So I bought a big bag of chilies, and he was dipping them into this Stilton and eating these raw chilies. And um, he said, he said, you're trying. I said, I'd rather not, Rinpoche. I, I, I said, uh, they have a really bad effect on me. He said, ah, oh, no, these are very sweet. So I said, uh, you want me to eat one? I said, right. I dipped it in the Stilton. And, I, and actually, he was right. Uh, I crunched into it. And it was sweet for uh, a, a minute second, and then it exploded in my mouth. And oh, God, he laughed. He, he also uh, got me a pint of milk immediately and told me to hold it in my mouth, and that would cure it. But um, I thought, this is going to be fun. <laughs> He's going to do stuff. But um, somehow um, I decided I was up for that. I, you know, I'd read the stories, I'd read about Mars Sitters, I'd read this stuff, so sure. Now, I, I don't think I was up for being abused, but I, I didn't count that as abuse. That, that didn't, it didn't feel like abuse, because he got me the milk and he was concerned about me. And, uh, and uh, he was also extremely kind to me. He answered my questions, he was very supportive, um, you know, it, it was a mixed bag, because you know? he gave me a pair. He gave me his pair of sunglasses, which were incredibly expensive things. You know, these Tibetan glasses. Um, they're made out of smoky quartz. They're they're basically like this. You know, they join. It, it's a little bit thicker, of course, but they're they're actually polished quartz crystal, and in Tibet. Um, um, apparently, Dudra Rinpoche had to pay two horses for a pair of these glasses, and he just gave them to me. Uh, so he, he was like that, as well as getting me to eat raw chili and uh, you know, eating an entire round of brie. So there was just these mixtures of experiences with him. So it was always um, highly creative, and uh, and a sense of the whole situation was being tested in a way, and worked with and encouraged in different ways. Sometimes it was a, a wrathful form of encouragement, sometimes joyous, sometimes peaceful. So, you know, the effect on me was that... Um, I'd actually say I just grew up. You know, that, um, I think a lot of us remain as children for a long time and, and not in any nice, innocent way, just just um, not capable of living properly, you know, not being responsible, not being... Um, I mean, his advice on, go to in, on, on going to India when people gave him advice was not how to find the cheapest hotel and make sure you're all right. It was, you just land, go into the first hotel, whatever it costs, spend your money, then it's gone, see what happens next. It was always throw yourself out life and see what happens. But you really had to be some kind of um, professional human being to do that. It was an adventure, and he wasn't really interested in anything being cosy. <laughs> so if you wanted to be cosy, you went somewhere else. But he never did that. Yeah, you mentioned Drukpa Kunle. Mm -hmm. um, um, could you talk a bit about about him? Yeah, Drukpa yeah. Kunle was um, very famous in Bhutan and and much loved in Bhutan. And um, uh, one of the things you find in Bhutan that you don't find in Tibet are symbols of Drukpa Kunle. There are penises everywhere, hanging over doors. Brightly colored ones with faces on them they're um <sighs> they're just part of life over there and um he's highly venerated um and and this of course is you know shocking behavior um, you know I think that sex with Chukpa Conley is a little bit like Jimmy Riggs and Boucher eating the brie. I don't think there's any big difference there. I mean, we live in a society where sex is a big issue. It, it wasn't a big issue there. 
you know it's entirely different it has a whole other meaning here i mean sexual exploitation wasn't really an issue then i mean sexuality occurred but it wasn't an issue it's an issue now there's certainly abuse now there's abuse of power uh, but you know Drupal Connolly didn't have hundreds of students he didn't have a procurement committee that's not how it worked he just wandered around and bumped into people and things occurred like Chimmy Riggs and Roche came to my house and ate an entire round of brie, I see it as being the same story. You know, and um, what what comes out of that extraordinary behaviour is um, a sense of being projected into uh, a different dimension of reality where these things occur. These things here are normal. And relating to them as it's all part of what's happening is maybe similar in some ways to being at the theatre and you don't know the play. You don't know what's going to happen. Actually, the funniest play I ever saw was just like that. It was uh, The Real Inspector Hound, that was Tom Stoppard play that was put on at the art school where I was, and I, I was in the audience and they were performing it. And... Um, uh, the stage gun didn't go off. And so the, so the man was being shot when the gun didn't do anything. He said, ah, oh, the poison dart, and fell to the floor. And, and because, I, because I'd seen, I, I knew the story, it was just so funny, and I thought they should write to Tom Stoppard because this would have improved the play endlessly. You know? but, uh, it was just brilliant, you know. And there's, So there's a sort of a world there, there's a, there's a Vajra creation, Vajra theatrics are occurring. And within Vajrayana, which is um, majorly artistic, there are just scenarios. And so Drup Kunle would enter various scenarios. And they weren't all sexual. They, they were different. He would get some old man to chant some really crazy text that he'd just written that was... Uh, but what got the old man realization wasn't the text, it was his devotion to Drupa Kunli and the fact that he would simply recite a bunch of nonsense for hours on end. And he'd recite it even though his son and daughter were saying, you know, what, what, what on earth is this text you're chanting? You know, this is crazy. Well, he just wouldn't believe it. He just continued and... Um, so that's, that's the power of the story there. Of course, you know, doing whatever your teacher tells you to do in, in this environment is, is it has become suspect, you know. And I think people have to use their intelligence there and look at what the nature of the relationship is. I mean, I never, there was never one instance where either Chimerix and Rinpoche or Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche acted out of self-interest. They never got anything out of it. Well, Jim Rupert said, did get the entire round of brie, but it didn't break the bank, you know. I, I didn't suffer because of it, you know. Uh, he probably <laughs> suffered more through eating it than I did through losing it. But um, so it's really that, you know, Drupal Connolly had no self-interest. There's one story about him where he's, he's offered all this jewellery, uh, a fantastic wealth of jewellery, and he puts it all on. He accepts it. He, he dances with it, then he gives it all back again and leaves. He said, I enjoyed it, <laughs> and that was it. So he didn't take that offering of money. Um, so there has to be demonstrable lack of self-interest in it. And that comes out in the stories of Drupal Connolly. People are confused because, of course, they, they look at someone like Sogyal Lakar and say, what's the difference? Uh, the difference is that the uh, ladies with whom um, Drupal Kunli had sex didn't end up with a therapist. You know, they achieved realisation. That's the difference. And uh, nobody had a complaint to make about him. 
I mean, I know it's very hard to compare somebody long in the past with someone in the present, and there are all those considerations. Um, I think one of the differences is cultural, uh, in as much as if you lived in Tibet or if you lived in India, there was some expectation that there would be people like this. Um, so it wasn't entirely surprising, and you could either go along with it or not. Um, I think one of the problems now is that um, there's a similarity between rock music culture and Tibetan lamas, and Tibetan lamas can, if they want, manifest that that groupy scene. Um, now, the difference is that groupies are not expecting anything. Groupies are not expecting to be on the next album. They know what's going on. They know why they're there. They're not expecting anything they get or don't get. It's just what happens. Now, in the whole Vajrayana situation, there is an expectation. I'm going to get realization out of this or something. And then when that doesn't happen, and in fact worse happens, and physical abuse occurs, then, then there's incredible confusion that goes on there. I think basically there's a... Um, what's it called? Math. Well, I'm not good at math. An equation yeah, between how weird it gets and what the good result is. So, the more extraordinary the behavior of the teacher, the more extraordinary the realization has to be. It's concomitant. If that's not there, then one has to question what's happening. So all, all you can do really is look at the stories of Drupal Kunle. You can't go and interview the people. You've only got the story. And, and what the story relates is that these people attained realization. Now, whether that was a big clean-up that occurred later or not, who knows? But no one's going to know anyway. You've only got the story. And the story in itself has to be taken as a teaching that extraordinary behavior, extraordinary result, that's what's in the story. That's the only bit that we can use, really. And that if there's extraordinary behavior and misery, then this is not the Drupal Kundi story. I think that's all, you, all that can be taken out of it. That's not a method, uh, method story. It says, do this and good, and good things will happen. Yeah. So let me ask on a different track. The two of you, um, you mentioned earlier, are reincarnations of... It was Aro Yeshe? Aro Lingma was his mother. Right. Yeah, and he was called Aro Yeshe. Yeah. However, I should point out that he was killed in an avalanche. So I'm the result of the avalanche. You get incarnations who, who, who die with, with uh, awareness and pass through and uh, are great beings, and uh, I'm the result of several thousand tons of ice. <laughs> I'm curious if, and you're also, you mentioned, what was the name of the, per, the concert? I Kandra. What does that mean to you? Does it have any opera effect on how you operate? Do you have any connection um, with those previous incarnations, memories, tendencies, etc.? Well, um, I don't have a connection, really. Um, I have had one dream um, where I dreamt that I was escaping from somewhere. And, um, it, I mean, it was an unpleasant dream, uh, and I was with someone who was... Well, I wasn't with them, but they were, they were hung while I was there, and then I ran away, and I don't remember anything else. But I... Well, I don't know whether that was a dream of um, some past life. It was a very strong dream, but... But on the whole, I don't really have... Um, a strong... sense of being Iacandro, so I don't think it affects me. <laughs> other than I presumably have been many other people in previous lives. Mm. So. 
it doesn't really uh, play a great part in what I do from day to day. Um, I've had a lot more in the way of dreams, memories, uh, visionary uh, visionary material when I was young, but um, uh, I don't talk about it a great deal. It, 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 you know, it's not a, a major factor in, in how uh, the teaching is put across. Um, it's just there as part of my history, really. Um, Certain aspects of it, I was told by Chimmy Riggs and Rinpoche and by Dujan Rinpoche, who, who told me things about uh, Aroyeshi. There are various things from dreams. Um, sometimes I, I, I've gone through periods where I've had more dreams. I, I haven't had any dreams for years now. They seem to have dried up, but, uh, but I don't explore it. I, 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 I'm not trying to find out more in particular because there's nothing I'd do with it, even if I could remember it. Um, Why do you think that they would tell you things, Chimera Rinpoche and Dujon Rinpoche? Why would they mention it at all? Well, it's important in that um, um, tradition, because we're the holders of the Tama, and so we should know something about it. Uh, uh, the Tama was something I received from Aralingma, so there was that experience, which was quite... Uh, colossal really but um, since then there hasn't been a great deal I mean the Tama is enough to be going on with It's uh, I haven't uh, taught it all yet certainly um, I, I've taught a lot of the Kumye mm. um, many of the Yidam practices some of the Dzogchen Long Day practices but there's still a, a, over a third left to teach Hopefully I can get through it before I die. So it's mainly a responsibility. Um, can you talk a bit about receiving that terma? Maybe a line about what a terma is and then perhaps the story of, of that time. Um, well, a terma is an entire body of teaching um, that includes uh, various particulars. It needs to include everything that's required. Um, the Arutea, for example, includes three bodies of physical practices that relate with the three series of Dzogchen. The Arutea is primarily Dzogchen Thelma. It does include some Maha Yoga. It's got a, a cycle of 111 visionary practices of Yidams. Uh, it has practices of Tsokolo, um, Jinsreg, which is fire ceremony. So it's got a, a small body of Maha Yoga teaching, but mainly it's a Dzogchen method. And uh, this will be received uh, in an instant. Uh, so there's not much to say about it apart from one, m m one moment I didn't know it and the next moment I knew it all. And that just happened uh, on an occasion one night in Boda. And then the next day I went and I told um, Dujan Rinpoche about it, who was expecting me to have this experience anyway. And so he just asked me to enumerate the parts of it, which I did, and then he said I'd have to practice it all before I taught it. Uh, I also had to um, complete the nondros, which I had done at that point. There were the shorter, longer um, country young teak and the Troma Nondros, I completed those and, and, and the practice of Troma. Uh, and then I went on to practicing the Arotea. I practiced all of that and then I began to teach that in the 1990s, in the late 1990s. So it came completely fully formed? Yes. With all the detail? Everything. Precisely there. Mm -hmm. You're sitting there in meditation, I assume. You were on retreat, weren't you? Mm -hmm. When that happened to you? Well, not exactly in retreat. I was just in Boda, and I was going to see Dujan Rinpoche, and it was just one night sitting, practicing, and and then I knew it. Well, for instance, if, if suddenly I've, somebody gives me a mansion, it's, it's mine all at once, right then and there. Mm -hmm. But I need to still go into the mansion and see what's in there, see the different rooms, even though it's all mine right there, dropped, you know, dropped in my back garden. Perhaps the case. 
I still need to look in all the rooms to understand what the thing is inside. Yeah, it's not like that. What's it like? Was a, well, you have the architectural plans of the house, uh, the wiring system, the um, plumbing. Foundation. Everything is, is there immediately. Does that come with a certain level of realisation or attainment at the same time? Not always, no. Um, it simply means that I know the entire system and and so I so I simply teach it. Um, you know all the mantras, the melodies for them, the whole thing. It's pretty out there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. I, I can't really compare it uh, apart from having told uh, uh, Dujum and Bajay about it and. And also Dilgo Kienzer Rinpoche and uh, Kunzang Dorje Rinpoche, so they know all, know all about it, or they knew all about it. But, um, um, but I have no way of comparing what it was like for anyone else receiving that, apart from they said, yes, this is how it happens. The other thing that occurred that is probably, uh, well, either more or less comprehensible, is uh, when I was very young, I was always either dreaming of a white lady or seeing a white lady in my room, which was a problem for my father. He didn't want me seeing white ladies in my room. And uh, My mother thought they were dreams, and I said, well, I think some of them are, but I, I'm sure some of them aren't because I'm awake. And um, I used to find ways to show myself that I was awake, like sitting up in bed and touching things and she'd still be there. Uh, now, she never spoke, um, but after seeing her, I always knew things, apart from the fact that I didn't know what I knew. I just knew that I knew something, which is uh, a very odd thing to say, um, but it did affect me in as much as I tended to understand things uh, that a child wouldn't usually understand. Because my father was, uh, his, <laughs> one of his lines was that, um, that uh, I, I might have to go to a mental hospital one day because I was too peculiar. And... Um, Strangely enough, this never frightened me as it would with a child. You'd imagine a child would be frightened by something like that. But I worked out, well, I, I hope he does take me to the mental institute because they'll look at him, keep him, send me home. Now, this is not normal for a child to rationalise in that way because I thought, well, you're a big florid face and being angry. You look, you look crazy. I don't. Um, so I, I, I'd have a rationale like that, and uh, the whole idea of God and the devil made no sense to me either. I, I, so I, I had a girlfriend at the age of five whose parents were atheists, and as soon as I heard about this, I thought, oh, of course, this whole thing is nonsense, this, this God business. I don't believe in this, you know. So um, I became a born-again atheist at that point, and... It just the whole thing made sense, and uh, uh, so um, I tended to be able to come to understandings of life events that were not normal for a child. And I, I only in hindsight can I see that oh right, whatever was coming out of these visions was somehow putting in the DOS or something, you know, the DOS level under there, and that later um, struggling with um, Buddhist texts, you know, translations, you know, Edward Konzo on the Heart Sutra, diabolical. I'd struggled through this stuff, and um, Helmut Hoffmann and uh, Giuseppe Tucci, uh, who's the worst? Um, Evans went, hmm? 
Oh, Gunther was yeah, Gunther was a nightmare too. But um, I, I could get through it and understand what they were talking about, even though the language was diabolical, because the 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 basis of it made sense, and so. I, I, I had a way of seeing through that language, even though I was having to use the dictionary for it all the time. Uh, I mean, pristine perspicacity for Yeshe. I mean, give me a break, you know. I was, <laughs> he was always uh, using this language, and I, I had to work out that he meant Yeshe by that. So what do you make of that lady, then? The white lady? Oh, well, at, at first... Uh, being interested in Vikings as I was at that age, I, you know, I thought she was Frigg or Freya. <laughs> then I saw my first book on Tibet when I was at junior school. I, I've got them up there still, books by two Czechoslovakian explorers. They were somehow in the school library. And I saw a picture of White Tara in there. And then I thought, oh, no, it's White Tara. And I thought she was White Tara until I met um, Dujamabache and he told me, no, she's not White Tara, she's Aralingma. It took him some days to work that out. At first he said, hey, I don't know who she is. And, and then a couple of days later he said, she is Kyungshin Aralingma, she attained rainbow body, she's a Teraton. And then he gradually told me about myself. He was extraordinary for this. He knew all kinds of things about me that he had no way of knowing. How did he figure that out, do you think? About Aralingma? Yes. I don't know. Uh, I was very polite. Uh, uh, I'd learned how to be Tibetan. You, you don't ask those questions. Oh, you can ask them, but I mean, uh, especially then, you know, back in 1971, you don't say, so, so how, how do you know that? You, you just don't ask that kind of question. You, know, you don't ask personal questions. I mean, you can ask for some aspect of Dharma to be explained, but not how do you know that. That would be very rude. So I, there were many things that I wish I had asked that I never asked, that I just never found out. <laughs> but, I mean, you're actually the first person who's asked us this question. Um, about the reincarnation part, uh, all of it, yeah. So this is uh, this is all all entirely um, new. We don't talk about this. Mm. Well, uh, actually, a lot of it's in the book. Um, mm. or, Goodbye uh, forever, the upcoming book. Yeah, um, I say uh, not all of it. Some bits I aren't even in the book, um, but. Uh, we tend to be a bit wary of talking about it because there are all kinds of people talking about stuff out there. Well, I mean, people have talked a lot about you made it all up, haven't they, mm -hmm. in the past? Yeah. There's been a lot of online internet stuff. Well, seeing as you, you, know, you brought it up, it's not run-of-the-mill every day. As you said, people are not expecting masters to be walking around the place and people aren't expecting to do an evening set and suddenly have an entire system downloaded in their mind. Mm -hmm. And as you say, there you've had uh, people who are very sceptical of, of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that's historically always been the case, isn't it? Scepticism of treasure of Elis, yes. uh, and these sorts of things. Particularly with Dujam Lingpa. Yeah, he was accused of being a fraud for, greater, for quite a portion of his life. And mm -hmm. uh, Lingpa in mm -hmm. Bhutan, a major Tertan. Mm -hmm. um, most of his life, there was a body of people who thought he was fraudulent and there were those who followed him and thought he was wonderful. So what's it like to be on the receiving end of that sort of treatment? I think it's far less unpleasant now than it was in the past. I think when it started mm -hmm. happening, it was um, um, disheartening, I'd say, um, What's it been like? Well, it's, it's been limiting. I mean, obviously, we're struggling at the moment to get a, re a retreat centre together. I think if it hadn't happened, we'd have the retreat centre now. It's, it's just limited us, basically. I mean, that's all it's done. Um, it's been unpleasant, but then who doesn't have an unpleasant aspect to their lives, something they have to put up with? Um, 
I apologise for putting a preposition at the end of the sentence, but uh, as it's a figure of speech, I think I'm allowed to get away with it. Um, one of my aims in life is to speak English before I die. You know, perfect English. I'd love to be able to do that, you know, like some... Speak like a Jane Austen novel, you know, but anyway, that's an aside. Um, that would be a real accomplishment. A city. A city, yes. <laughs> I think that there are different rules for Western people and Tibetans. Uh, and, and I think that um, there's a problem that I see as existing in terms of people wanting status. Um, status doesn't particularly interest either of us. We just teach and we're fairly informal um, we, we actually don't enjoy veneration and when people heap it on it's not what, uh, we really don't like it um, so we're not in it for that business um, I think that um, as it's been um, the highest point you can achieve as a Western person is as a translator. That's the top of the tree. And I think there's a lot of resentment toward anyone who does anything else. And I, I think Western people like to pull each other down. Mm. Whereas they wouldn't dream of acting in that way with Tibetans. Um, there seems to be a cultural divide there. And um, that seems to be a problem. Uh, I mean, we have Tibetan friends, Tukudakpa in Finland, and uh, as far as he's concerned, we're reasonable people. <laughs> so we have friends as well as enemies. Um, what the enemies get out of it, I don't really know. Uh, it's subsided. Mm. I think that um, you know, if you try to achieve an end for 20 or 30 years and you've not succeeded, then, then the more you try, uh, the more futile you have to become in what you're doing because you're failing. So um, people have not managed to get rid of us, so we continue to exist. Uh, we still teach, we still have functions, and mm. we're... I mean, we have a small, mo a small sangha, mm. but they're incredibly hard-working, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, great people. Uh, yes, it, um, I think that's the worst effect, is, is for them, because they're such mm. a small bunch of people, they all have to work really hard to get anything done. But they, they've all got full-time jobs as well. And I don't like to see people... Mm. Pouring themselves into something, yeah. Um, although it's their home, they're not doing it for us. They're, I mean, they're very much at home in the tradition, so they're doing it for the tradition and themselves. And but I don't like to see people who are overworked. It, mm. it, so it would be lovely to have a few more students, just so that people don't have to work. So the yeah. work could be divided up more. You know, the work they've done has has been uh, against. Uh, these obstacles, yes. you know, it, it's not yeah. just work, it, 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 it's extra work, you know, mm. to, you, know, you know, to have to you know, combat that in some way. But, mm. but it's lessened a great deal, I, I think, basically, because people have given up. You know, they, nothing seems to happen, we don't go away, and whatever people do doesn't really achieve a great deal. So. I, I suppose in some ways you were coming out of left field with the Gurkha Changlo day or the white sangha, anyway. the, the non-celebrate practice. Yeah, it's... Because when you first started teaching, people said, well, it's made... You know, the concept of the white sangha, the, the non-celebrate practice, the nakpa, yeah, like, I... he's made it all up. It was unknown so at that time. Yeah. Yes, it was. So there was that sort of, he's made it all up, as well as the fact that he's a fraudulent tertan having made it all up, you know. These were Tibetans who were saying, well, I've never heard of them. Yeah. Because they hadn't. Because <laughs> there weren't... Once the second spread happened in terms of the history from the 
10th, 11th century onwards, the number of Gurkha Changlo practitioners really reduced. So they weren't well heard of. People hadn't heard of them, and, and monasticism bloomed. Well, or particularly Western people hadn't heard of them. And mm. then the next thing they didn't believe in that I'd made up was Nakmas, you know, mm. female. Mm. And now that they found 500 of them in Golok, you know. And, yeah. but, but none of these people who, who said, not for sure, I'm lying about these things, have ever apologized to me for it. You know, that, uh, they were highly vociferous about saying they didn't exist, there weren't Nakmas. Um, it's been interesting, so... Um, but um, how did you know that they were? I'd seen pictures of them in books. Uh, Anna Greek Govinda, Way of the White Clouds. There's a picture of Ajarepa Rinpoche in there. Um, I can show it to you later. Um, and then you met them, didn't uh, you? So yeah, you went to... uh, well, I, I wanted to meet them. Mm -hmm. um, and also, Helmut Hoffmann's book has a fantastic picture. In the, there are a few of those old travel books that have pictures of Ngakpas. Um, and so I knew they were there. And, um, and I'd read enough to know about them, you know, you know from what I had read. Um, and then um, Dujra Rinpoche asked me if I would establish the Gurkha Changla Day in the West. And this was the next funny thing, because I said, oh, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And he sort of looked at me. He said, this will be difficult. He said, you will have many obstacles if you try to do this. You know, I, I, I want you to understand that that it will not be easy. You know. And then he told me the story about how, how he was um, thrown in prison as a Chinese spy by certain factors. And I won't go into the whole story, but there was an... an out exile this was. Hmm? In exile, yes. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, that came from the highest quarters. He was locked up and... And it was only through the royal family of Bhutan, Sikkim, and Nepal appealing to Nehru that he was released. And then the story was put around that he was drunk and taken in for, um, what, what's it called? Um, drunk and disorderly. Drunk and disorderly, you know, outrageous behavior. And he told me that story and, and he said, this is what they do. This is how you will be treated. He said, not in the West, but here in India, anything is possible. So um, he then warned me, you know, never to tell anyone I was coming to India or where I'd be at any one point because if I started promoting the Gurkha Changla Day, there'd be factors who didn't want that happening. Um, I think it's fine now because it's out of control, the whole thing. Everybody knows about them and there are people... There are people now asking their Tibetan teachers for this, you know, uh, for ordination into the Gurkha Changla Day. They've never heard of me. Um, now, fortunately, I did it for Dujra Mirche. I didn't do it to be famous. So for me, that they don't know about me is even better because the thing has actually succeeded and will roll on without me. You know, I don't need to be there to do it anymore. It's, it's not stoppable now. So people are aware of the tradition and, and it will actually become established again. So I'm, I can die happy knowing that, that it's actually worked, you know, that um, it's good. Because I think the future of Buddhism is, uh, is in the Gurkha Changlo day rather than the monastic system. Um, I think that monasticism will always be valuable for certain people who are, who are appropriate for it, you know, who it serves well. But I think the minority, the majority would be better served by a, a, a non-celibate priesthood, especially in terms of understanding their lives. Because they've run into great problems with this in Catholicism too, in, in terms of child abuse and this was endemic in uh, Tibetan monasteries, you know, the pederasty. I mean, um, Kuznak Dorje Rinpoche told, told me about it. As did Chimmy Riggs and Rinpoche, you know, it was no big secret there. Now, this is not healthy. 
Yeah, I'm sure there are many wonderful monks and nuns, uh, particularly nuns. Uh, interestingly enough, um, both Chimmy Riggs and Rinpoche and Kung and Dojo Rinpoche said the same thing about nuns. He said they are real practitioners. He said, do you want to know why? He said, there's no status. They get no status from it. They must really want to do it, you know. He said, you can't say that for the monks, but the nuns are all good practitioners. I think, unfortunately, it will be uh, many generations before that status actually looks like status. There's a way of getting status without getting status. You know, it could be in name. I, I'd be surprised if they weren't treated more or less the same, even with full nun ordination, I think. Until society changes a great deal, um, it's, it's going to be equal yet unequal. I mean, I hope that's not the case. I mean, I'm not wishing it on them, but... Um, uh, it was 1971, and the first time I'd met Doji Mabuchi, I'd been s sent to him by Ngakpa Yeshi Doji, with whom I'd studied first, and um, he recommended that I sought out uh, Doji Mabuchi for you know, teaching. And um, Doji Mabuchi was very interested in my life and wanted to ask me questions about it because he perceived people had died and what, what had happened. And, and I told him I'd been in a band and that it had fallen apart because the lead player and bass player had died within a month of each other, one from a heart attack, uh, from, uh, from having a weak heart, and the other in a car crash with his father at the wheel. So it wasn't even a sort of a classic um, you know, um, rock band death. It was, um... And so anyway, he asked me, you know, what kind of music? And I said, blues. And he said, blues at night. I said, well, this is music played by uh, uh, black African Americans. And he said, how sounding? And he said, you sing? So I said, you'd like me to sing some blues, Rinpoche? He said, yeah, yeah, you, you singing. So, so I just said, gypsy woman told my mother before I was born, you got a poor child coming, etc. Um, I was a bit tentative at first, but I thought, if you're going to hear it, I, I can only do it loud. I can't sing quietly. So, um, And he said, what meaning? And I thought, oh, God, what meaning? You know, because I've got to translate this into a form of English that can be translated into Tibetan. So it was basically nomad Kandro told my mother, you know, Hoochie Coochie Man was a very interesting person, you know. <laughs> it was not, not a real translation, but um, he said, good, 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 powerful song. You, you always must be singing this. And um, so... Uh, I wanted to give up going to art school. I'd finished foundation. And I thought, well, what's the point of going on to do that now? You know, I should just keep coming out to India. But he was insistent that I shouldn't do that. I should go back and I should complete my degree course. He said, because you'll need qualifications in life. You know, So I did that. But um, he said, anyway, art is very important. All the arts... And so both he and um, Kwanzaa Dojo Rinpoche really insisted that art was crucial and that, you know, both of them said, you know, you shouldn't, <laughs> you should always be a blues performer, you know, you shouldn't give that up. Well, your introduction to blues is quite interesting. There have been quite a few strange uh, events in my life, like you know, meeting Mr. Love, a lovely old gentleman who lived in our road, uh, who was shell-shocked, according to my mother. I'm not quite sure what that means, apart from he had psychotic interludes. But he was like some kind of Somerset mom looking gentleman who sat in his garden... Um, 
He'd been out in Washington, D.C. somewhere. I think he was involved in something diplomatic. And he started collecting blues records, and it was, it was an, an interest of his. He had a whole huge heap of them. And um, I, was, I used to go and sit in the lane at the, at the end of the gardens, and I sat at the, uh, the, in the willow tree at the end of his garden. I used to like to listen to this music because... Um, for a young English lad in the 50s, it was, he never heard anything like that. It was from some other planet completely. You know, blues is, um, back then, you know, no one sang like that. No one made sounds on instruments like that. Um, so he saw me at the end of the garden and asked me, you know, what I was about up in that tree. And I said, I'm listening to the music. Is that all right? And he said, oh, sure, well, come to the garden if you want to hear it. So he pulled me out of deck chair and his, his sister brought out some ginger beer and we sat listening to blues and then he just proceeded to give me an education on it. Every time I went, he'd bring them out, he'd, he'd, he'd get them in advance for something he was going to show me. And, and he just said, you know, if I ever I talk strange, just, just walk on, just ignore me, you know, because he was aware he had these psychotic interludes. He, he didn't have them often and... He, he just used to talk to himself. That's all, all, all he did. He, he didn't do anything too crazy. But, um, but a wonderful man. And um, so I got this whole education in blues from him and, uh, and, and, the amb- and the ambition to be a blues player when I grew up. You know, that was really um, set in me at that time. So I've sometimes said, you know, I've got you know, you know, two religions, Buddhism and blues. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Mm-hmm. 